Hello my friends and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video of myself, Amata. If you're new to this channel, my name is Amata, as I just said, and I run this channel with Paul. The reason you haven't heard my voice lately for all of you wondering, new to the channel or not, I've just been in the background editing Paul's videos, doing my thing in the background, in the shadows, woo. But yeah, I'm just fine, thank you so much for everyone who asked, and welcome to the channel for everyone new. And we've had quite a few new subscribers lately, so thank you for your support. And I hope you enjoy. Anywho, I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours, as always. And we're going to be beginning with some news regarding Navi 21 and 22. So this tweet comes to us from Kamachi Ansaka on, on Twitter, whose name you should be very familiar with by this point. They are a very well-known leaker for anything related to tech. Anywho, they have tweeted a HW Info version update. So basically, this confirms a few things, and you can see the link below in the, in the description below this video, sorry, should I say, if you want to read the full thing. It's fairly short, but the main thing that we can take away from this is that we are going to be seeing support for Navi 21 and Navi 22 added soon. Now, this is in the upcoming changes, not the latest version, just for those of you who are looking at the link I've provided below. So this confirms basically that Navi 21 and 22 are 100% a real thing. HW Info only updates when support is actually going to be added in the future and obviously while they'll be adding support for cards that aren't real. So we're going to move on to our next AMD topic for today, but I feel like the confirmed existence of Navi 22 can't be understated. Anywho, we're going to move on to our next topic, which is regarding an unannounced Ryzen 4000 APU. And this particular piece of information is thanks to our good friend Appysack over on Twitter, who you should also be very familiar with. So obviously AMD did reveal their Ryzen 4000 U series chips for laptops back in January, but there was something missing. There was a Ryzen 9 shaped hole in the lineup. However, a Ryzen 9 4900U was spotted on a user benchmark by Tom Apisak and he obviously helpfully tweeted it. So what information can we actually glean from this? Well, you can find the link to, in the description below this video but we can see that it's 8 cores, 16 threads, 1.8 gigahertz, and a turbo of 2.35. So the cool thing to take away from this is that we will be seeing a Ryzen 9 part on the lineup if indeed this leak turns out to be accurate. But the main thing to take away from this is that the 4900U and the 4800U do share the same configuration. The main thing that's going to differentiate the two is obviously going to be the higher clock speeds on the 4900U that is going to set it apart. Now obviously another thing to keep in mind with this is that this is very likely an engineering sample. So obviously the numbers here of you know, performance specs blah 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 are going to change. At the moment, the 4800U is outscoring the 4900U, which obviously doesn't make any sense. So obviously we are going to be seeing those scores improve as we actually move further towards final silicon. And again, engineering samples are not really true indicators of final specs. We can always expect to see a slight bump in the specs before a product is actually released when we turn when we see sorry a benchmark for a engineering sample or unreleased product. However, with that said, well, let's move to our final AMD topic of the day, which is regarding the B550. And yes, I said B550, and no, it's not actually finally out, unfortunately. Honestly, this thing is so late, it's just honestly... Yikes. Anywho, so basically what we have is some information thanks to Rogame, which has shown us that a Gigabyte B550 Gaming X is a thing that exists, and obviously you can see the information that he very kindly shared with us on screen. Now for those of you who are going to be following the link in the description below this video, you'll also scroll down a little bit and see a point very well made by Paul that yeah, be ready just in time for Ryzen 4000 this rate. Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to say with it being so, so late. I honestly feel like they should just chuck this whole thing in the bin at this point. It's ridiculous. Obviously, I'm being a bit hyperbolic, but you get my point. Anywho, we're going to move on now to our console portion of this particular video. We're going to begin with the Xbox One, sorry, the Xbox Series X, excuse me, and the PS5 after that. 
Now I'm sure you guys know what this is regarding, but let's just go through it anyway. I want to talk about the controller reveal. Now the big reveal obviously was the PS5, and I'm going to get to that in a second because I'm going to talk about that for longer. Anywho, so in response to Sony's reveal of the new PS5 controller, the Xbox official Twitter account did tweet a short video of the controller of the Xbox Series X. You will notice that it looks pretty much identical to that of the Xbox One. The main differences are there's a new button in the middle, which is obviously going to be some sort of share button. And the D-pad looks different to me as well. It looks like it's kind of the the D-pad from the Elite controller, or it's just an improved D-pad. Now, I will say the Xbox One D-pad in comparison to the Xbox 360 D-pad was miles better. I mean, that's not really difficult because Xbox 360 D-pad was literally garbo, but still. Nice to see them sticking with what works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's a saying for a reason, and to be honest, they don't really need to make any wild adjustments to the... Uh, design of the Xbox One controller. So I'm not really shocked to see them stay with the tried and true uh, controller design here. The real difference of course is with the PS5 controller. Now this is a pretty significant departure for Sony. Now obviously it still has a D-pad, two thumbsticks and obviously the triangle circle X and square. We're not all of a sudden dealing with something like, I don't know, the GameCube controller. Ugh. But it is still a significant departure. It looks like, to be honest, that they have definitely taken some inspiration from the Xbox One controller. The design definitely gives me that vibe, and not just because it's mostly white now, with obviously the lower half being black. It's just the, 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 look, the look of it gives me that feel. And to be honest, I, I'm not sure how I feel about it, and I think it's going to be decided by how it feels to hold and to use when you're actually gaming. Um, but it looks like it's actually going to be more comfortable to hold because the PS4 controller, it was fine, but I preferred the Xbox One controller just because I have huge man hands. I know you can't see me right now, but just take my word for it. I have got some huge man hands and it just, it was more comfortable to hold for me, that being the Xbox One controller. So if they've kind of taken a leaf out of Microsoft's book in that regard, then cool. Now obviously is this is very different, it's definitely going to ruffle some feathers, obviously we don't see a share button anymore, what we have instead is a create button feature which is the same thing, just renamed. And we are obviously going to see some feedback, like we have been seeing rumoured for some time. We have, we are going to see, sorry, adaptive triggers on the L2 and R2 buttons, and they have renamed the controller the Dual Sense, which is... I mean, it's fine, but it's also a pretentious marketing name and just kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but it is what it is. It's not really that important. Now, obviously, the adaptive triggers and the feedback is definitely going to be a bit of a controversial one. I know that Paul and I, when we were talking on the phone earlier, um, he was saying that he really doesn't like the feedback. It just, I don't know, he just doesn't like it. Personally, I always turn, like, rumble or vibrate off just because it's annoying, but that's not really the same thing as, as haptic or adaptive feedback. Again, I really do think it's going to come down to how it feels to hold in your hand. It does look like they've listened to the criticisms over the DualShock 4. It still has the lighting on it though, which does drain battery. That's kind of a bummer. And it still has a built-in uh, microphone on the controller itself. But I see that as Sony just trying to put less gates between someone purchasing a game and being able to play, say, the online multiplayer functionality. Because... If someone wants to play an online game, oh, they don't have a mic, they don't have a headset, or whatever. If they can use that, at least it's it's better than nothing. Um, you know, better than not being able to fully like participate in like a team-based game or whatever. So, let me know your thoughts on the PS5 controller. I'm undecided. It's definitely going to take some getting used to, but again, like I keep saying, it's going to come down to how it feels to use. That's my opinion. Let me know your thoughts though. Anywho, we're going to finish things up with our final, final topic of today, which is regarding Resident Evil 8. Now, obviously, Resident Evil 3, the remake, just came out. Just finished it myself the other day. My overall opinion is it's really good, just very short. Hopefully, there's more free content like we saw with Resident Evil 2. Regardless, though, we are talking about Resident Evil 8. It's been a while since we saw a numbered entry into the series. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing it. Obviously, we had some rumors a while back saying that we wouldn't see it till 2021, which makes perfect sense. But now we have an article thanks to Rely on Horror.com. Now, you may remember 
the Resident Evil Ambassador test event back in March, which I talked about, and how we might see some information come out from that. So, these people have thankfully reached out to Rely on Horror and some other websites as well to give them the skinny on what they could take away from the the demo. Obviously, this is an unfinished product at the moment. Now, this is spoiler story related stuff, so if you don't want to have this game potentially spoiled, now again, these details could change before the final release, but I'm just warning you, if you don't want to hear spoilers, potential spoilers, I should say, I would shut off now. So, it's under the working title, Village Resident Evil, but I'm going to just assume that's just where the game starts, or maybe that will be what it's called, and the graphic that's been released, the VI, and then the dashes of the L's are highlighted to make eight, in uh, Roman numerals of course. And apparently the opening of the game is going to be shocking for long-term fans, and it's going to involve Chris Redfield in some way, and obviously he did appear at the end of Resident Evil 7. Ethan is once again the lead protagonist, the guy that obviously we were playing as Resident Evil 7, so that pretty much almost confirms a first-person perspective as well, and it's going to be after the events of Resident Evil 7 as well. So... We also don't know actually what inventory the system is going to use, the game is going to use, sorry. Now obviously Resident Evil 7 went to back to a more traditional Resident Evil formula, but I'd say one of the most loved inventory systems in Resident Evil was the attaché case system that we saw in Resident Evil 4, and I really like that actually, how it actually really enabled you to just squeeze in like, oh if you just move stuff around, oh I do have space that one green herb or first aid spray or whatever. I really like that flexibility of the attaché case, and I would actually really like to see that return. So the demo was set in a snowy village area sometime after the opening. Uh, you obviously play as Ethan, just exploring, and there's some NPCs in the houses, and they can talk to you to some degree. There are some wolf-like creatures that are apparently doing the rounds in this particular area, and apparently you do have a weapon. Um, Capcom said repeatedly with Resident Evil 7 they were not going with an amnesia style game and obviously they didn't um, but it is not very effective against these beast men that you see in this particular area and eventually you do find some more powerful weapons that you can actually use on these creatures but again they are very very strong and it might be more worth worthwhile sorry, to run and hide and try and sneak your way around them which does sound like they're cranking up the horror element a little bit which is good um, I feel like Resident Evil 7 got the balance about right. It's only near the end of the game that you really just didn't give a crap about the enemies because you've got like 50 million guns at that point. Um, obviously I'm being ridiculous. Anywho, so apparently the game is heavily inspired by that Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 3.5, which is a series of demos and trailers from scrapped versions of RE4 in case you're wondering what 3.5 is like I was. So it does seem that we're going to be seeing a slight departure from Resident Evil 7, maybe some RE4 elements, and I will say the village element immediately called up memories of Resident Evil 4. And to be honest, if it is like more like Resident Evil 4, that's fine with me. I would prefer a more horror-y game, maybe the original versions of RE4 where Leon was like going around with a torch on top of his gun and there was like ghosts or something around. That looked really cool. Not that the RE4 wasn't really cool, it's one of my favourite Resident Evils. Um, it's kind of the last good game before Capcom went completely off the rails and did 5 and 6. 7 was also a return to form. So I wouldn't mind a 4-ish influence, as long as it doesn't go too heavy on the action, that sounds good to me. So, there's quite a lot to take in here to be honest, and obviously this is a demo and apparently again there's multiple versions of the inventory going around and apparently there's some versions of the demo that have you escape a castle where some of the demos have you inside a village and you have to you know hide out from these monsters these beast men so obviously it does seem like it's obviously still in development nothing is concrete if they can't if they're not even decided on the inventory system yet they're probably basing that off player feedback then I can fully expect details to still be very fluid and changeable at this time to be honest, this all sounds pretty promising. As long as, as long as they don't give in to temptation and go too down the action route, I'm good. As I said, 4 was about as action-y as I would want Resident Evil to go. And I don't really want them to go back to 4 again. It was great, as I said, but I liked 7 so much. I want more like that. 4 influences? Cool. But let's not go full 4 and definitely not. let's not go full 6. Do not even talk to me about Resident Evil 6. Anywho. 
That's me done for this video. Let me know your opinions on everything I've discussed. I've been talking for over 15 minutes. My tongue is extremely dry. Thank you so much for your support. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.